I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the board uh, to the, I think it's our ninth annual Books and Blue uh, Library event. And we're thrilled you can be here. And I hope you all know right after the talk, about 500 feet away, there's a reception in the tent beside the library. And we hope you will all join us for that. Um, <coughs> Um, I'm both delighted and a little daunted to introduce Paige. Delighted because she's a very, very old friend of mine. I think I tried to remember when we first met. We met on an aeroplane, if you can believe it. We didn't know each other. We started talking. Um, and I'm daunted because although I know that Paige is an amazing gardener, a wonderful garden writer, has designed quite a few, uh, uh, had quite a few design, garden design projects. Um, I don't think I realized until I did a little research tonight um, how numerous her accomplishments are. Um, and not only she's written eight books, and um, she, she loves dogs, as you can see, uh, one is making an appearance, that's Posey, and two of her books were about animals and gardens. She did uh, two wonderful books on garden designers she admires, one I particularly love called Breaking Ground. Um, she wrote another two books on, on her garden. She lived, she and her husband Bosco, Paige has lived for 35 years in Salem, New York and had a beloved garden, Duck Hill, um, which was a wonderful, wonderful garden. And she wrote two books about that. And her most recent book, Uprooted, is about leaving that beloved garden and starting from scratch about five years ago. Uh, a wonderful garden in Falls Village, which um, uh, some of you may have seen. If you haven't, it's frequently open and you should see it. And that book, I want to let you know, we have copies of for sale, not here, but in the tent uh, during the reception. And, um, but in addition to all of this, she's director emeritus of the Garden Conservancy and was one of the co-founders of the wildly successful Open Days program. Uh, she's an honorary member of the Garden Club of America. I've never even heard of another honorary member. Uh, she's on the board of um, uh, Stonecrop, Hollister House Garden, and Cornwall's Little Guild. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, I think we're all really lucky that Paige and Bosco decided to leave, uh, leave Salem Ditch Salem for Northwest Connecticut. And one of the, um, several of her friends are here tonight, and although Paige, is, Paige and Bosco have lived here uh, a comparatively short time, I think they know more people than any of us. It's a sort of ongoing joke among her friends. Paige has an enormous talent for friendship, and um, I'm personally thrilled that she's going to be talking about the meadow tonight. So for <laughs> about one hour, uh, we can forget the ravages of the gypsy. Oh no, whoops, the sponge moth, I'm not allowed to go, that, that is, is destroying our gardens and focus on the meadow. So Paige tonight is talking about bringing the meadows into the garden and we're thrilled and delighted. not unaccomplished herself and is a great garden writer. I, I love Jane's works. Um, she, she writes in a way that, uh, that I can. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here and to see so many dear friends um, in the audience. And we are all so lucky in the, the northwest corner to be surrounded by gorgeous fields. Um, but in our yards, we have too much lawn. Uh, I know I have too much lawn. Um, an ecological dead space. Um, it, in, in so many gardens ar around 
America. Um, it's a tidy garden with nothing for the birds. So, I'm going to find this magic. This is a house on Main Street in Salisbury. And it was recently bought by Jeb and Sabina Brees, who are here in the audience. And it looks down on a lot of lawn. That's the view from the terrace of the house down to the street. And this spring, can you all hear me? Am I? Okay. This spring, Jeb, <coughs> Jeb decided to unmow. He, he's left, he and Sabina have left um, a piece of, the, you see it right in the foreground, a piece of uh, lawn, flat space, right by their terrace. And the rest, he has asked um, Mike Nadu, who is a, um, who lives in uh, Sharon, to help create uh, a meadow organically. And, and he, it's already started, um, and he is dreaming of when he can put paths in it and walk with his family um, through that meadow, uh, looking at birds and butterflies. He's documenting the whole thing, and I hope in a year or two that he's going to give a talk about the whole process of making a meadow. Um, <laughs> Doug Ptolemy, whom I'm sure you all know, says, or know of, says that reducing the amount of lawn we mow each week is the best thing we can do to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, and he, according to him, mowing our lawn for one hour is equivalent to, we produces um, pollution equal to driving in a gas engine car for 650 miles. I, it's, it's astonishing to, to think of that. And he says that in America we burn 80 million gallons of gas each year in our lawnmower engines to keep our lawns at bay. Um, Edwina von Gaal, uh, who is a landscape designer and a champion of natural systemic garden designs and a great hero of mine, um, reports that there are approximately 40 million acres of lawn in America. And she suggests that if we plant half of our lawns, if each of us plants half our lawns with natives, we will have 20 million acres of restored habitat. Um, a dream, but a wonderful dream. So here is a, a garden, actually, that Edwina uh, designed a number of years ago. It's in Bridgehampton. It's outside of a rather modern um, shingled house. And right outside the porch of the house, you're seeing this step here, is a lawn, a very nice lawn. And at the end of the lawn is a wall. And beyond that wall, straight ahead, is a native um, meadow of switchgrass, native switchgrass, panico. And um, on, on one side, the, the, you can see the meadow in the distance. And then on one side, she, there's a cherry orchard. And in that cherry orchard, she just raised the level of the grass a bit. So, that area probably gets mowed once a month instead of once a week. So you have that velvet lawn, and then you have this soft grass, and then you have a number of acres of native switchgrass meadow. Um, and I, I have to say, I mean, ecologically it's wonderful, but I love that contrast of patterns and texture 
um, between the lawn and the high grass and the meadow. And of course there's a path, and the path leads, in this case, at, at this place in Bridgehampton, the path leads down to a pond where she's uh, planted joe pie weed and ironweed and uh, blue flag iris and um, itia, so that there are all sorts of native wonderful things around the pond. So this, this is a path we have at our place. Um, I kind of feel, if you put a path in a field, it becomes a, it becomes a garden. Um, this is an old field um, belonging to Dick Button. He was a neighbor of ours in North Salem, New York. And he mowed a path in this field, um, and then he got a, a um, millstone a millstone and set it on its edge as to stop your eye and he says um, it's watch out for a hole in the ice this this what Dick Dick is always thinking in terms of ice skating this is a, a place in Scotland I went to and they were just playing with different lengths of grass again the idea of not knowing everything well, uh, once a week. And this, I just love, this was a chateau in France that had, in Normandy, that had um, maybe, it maybe was having hard times in any way. They couldn't have a fancy parterre the, the way they used to. So what did they do instead? They just played it, played with the pattern of a parterre with um, unmowing uh, part, of, part of the grass. I thought it was such fun and so clever. And this actually is a Russell Page garden in Normandy. Um, and this was away from the house. You had to, you, you were walking actually toward the vegetable garden. And all of a sudden there was this beach hedge enclosure. And you walked in and there's this sweetest little meadow. Uh, Simple, easy, not very much, but fun. This is a, a friend's house in Pennsylvania, and there's not a stitch of lawn. It's daffodils and later baptisia and rudbeckias and all sorts of meadow plants. And as you see, um, she has a, a, a narrow path going to a little city area at the back of the, of the of her yard. This is um, a beloved old friend of mine who no, no, no longer lives. I mean, she died of 93 or 94, named Netta Lockwood. And this was her garden in Bedford, New York. And if you were standing on her terrace outside her house, you were looking at rough grass and apple trees with a path mode in it. And that was it. And you, of course, wanted to go on an adventure. And so you followed that path, and it came to a gate. Um, and you went through that gate, and this is what was on the other side of the gate. And it was just so astonishing to have this this not garden, really, of roses and alliums and herbs um, in secret, way beyond the house. Um, just, just the opposite of what Russell Page tells us to do, which is to have your complicated gardens near the house with your wildland beyond. I, I just loved it. This is a place in Long Island belonging to an artist named Robert Yacob, and it's in Springs um, in the Hamptons. And he, this is the, the path from the French doors that, that open from the house. And on either side, he's got high grass and blueberry bushes and shad trees, and the path goes out um, to 
to the um, marsh, the salt marsh. Well, sometimes it's nice to look down on a meadow, and this is in Salisbury. It's um, Twin Maples. It belongs to Douglas Thomas. It's a 40-acre uh, extraordinary meadow, and she does open it, not for open days, but for other special occasions. And if you haven't been there, um, it's just an extraordinary place to go and, and see this, this native meadow. And um, this, is, this, is a, this is looking down from a house, a, a contemporary house in New Preston, built by the architect um, Peter Talbot. And this is their view of Lake Waramog. And because they, they wanted something quite contemporary, but they wanted a field, and so they put these stripes of rudbeckias in. And uh, when the rudbeckias are blooming, it's quite extraordinary. Well, we're on Nantucket now, and this is a typical Nantucket house with roses covering it, ramblers, and so on and the teensiest, tiniest bit of lawn. <clears throat> and that porch that you saw looks out onto this lawn and, of course, um, the water. But between the water and the lawn is the wild um, Nantucket uh, field. And on the side, that wonderful terrace um, of grass and flagstone just draws your eye out to that field and the rather fabulous uh, native uh, Nantucket landscape. And that's your garden, two, two stone vases of Alyssa. Well, now we're in, I, I am jumping around uh, for a while. Now we're back in Bedford, New York. This is um, a garden belonging, well, this is a, a house belonging to an architect named Keith Crager. Actually, it's his own house. He, Keith was always in love with barns, and so when he came to build his own house, he, he was thinking about barn spaces and barn openings. They're, they're very generous openings. And right below his house, after it was built, he sowed us this slope with native grasses. Um, and this is a view out their living room, and his wife Susan says, um, it's just a parade of wildlife. Turkeys and fox and coyotes and deer. And it's, he says, she says, it's a soaring place for birds because that, that tree line is really a wetland. And so it's, she says it's just magical. This is their tiny piece of lawn with a gate closing off the field and keeping the deer out. Well, traditionally, this is obviously just grass gone and left alone, um, but traditionally a, a meadow is primarily grasses. But we all, we all love, we all long for flowers, uh, forbs as they're called in meadow language. Uh, we long for the flowers and we long for the butterflies that they bring. But um, Doug Tommy says in order to have butterflies, you have to make butterflies. And to make butterflies, you need um, the native plants, the native flowers that the larvae of the butterfly prefer. And our birds um, desperately need those caterpillars, those, those larvae, for protein when they're nesting. And as an example, um, a pair of chickadees um, need six to 9,000 caterpillars to feed um, their, uh, one small clutch of their young. Unfortunately, I think chickadees are one of the birds 
that doesn't like gypsy moths. Um, but I was reading up on it, and apparently Baltimore Orioles do like them, so that's kind of a nice thought. Um, Now we're out in Lake Forest, Illinois, and this is the home of a wonderful woman named Sue Dixon. And Sue used to live in a typical, traditional house in Lake Forest with manicured lawns and boxwood and perennial gardens. And she used to walk in this piece of virgin prairie nearby. And at one point, she was lucky enough to buy about five acres of it and they sold their house and they built a low lodge um, with a deck and uh, on five acres of, of this prairie. Um, and, and she says, no staking, no deadheading, no edging. Um, they have this, this wonderful deck and they're big party givers. And her husband was telling me that one time they were giving a party and one of his friends came over to him and said, Wes, when are you getting rid of all these weeds? <laughs> and he said to me, you know, Paige, we have a lot of droughty weather in Illinois. And when our neighbor's lawns are brown, our prairie is green. And this is why. If you look, um, <laughs> that is grass, <laughs> as opposed to Indian grass and little blue stem and cone flower and so on and so forth. And so it is true that meadow plants can take tremendous amount of drought. You don't have to be watering, you don't, it's just extraordinary. Um, this is our beloved coneflower, this is Echinacea purpurea, and um, it, it, it is, its pollen is important for um, a lot of mid-season butterflies. And this, um, this coneflower that you see is the prairie coneflower. It's called Echinacea pallida. And this is a garden um, created by Pete Uldoff. Um, Pete Uldoff, 30 years ago, this great, famous now garden designer, 30 years ago, he was triumphing, championing our native prairie um, and meadow plants and showed us what wonderful garden plants they are. It really took this Dutchman to say, hey America, wake up. These are really extraordinary plants. And he uses them in all his gardens, as, as I'm sure you know. This is, actually this is my favorite coneflower. This is a picture of 100 Main, which is Buddy Williams' shop in, in Falls Village. And this is a plant, all the planting outside the shop is native. Uh, in the back is an allium called Allium cernum, which is one of our native alliums. And this in front is Echinacea tennesseensis. And I love this coneflower because it, it faces you. It, it's kind of different than the other coneflowers, and it blooms for a long period of time, and it's very showy. Um, it's endemic to Tennessee, but it does very well here. And this is one of the island beds in Falls Village. And a few of us got together and planted them with little blue stem and uh, cone flowers and um, pedestamen and butterfly weed. And here's, here's another one. Um, we replaced some really scuzzy looking old roses. Um, and I like, I like to think 
I like to think that we're part, or Falls Village is part of the biological corridor. Um, this is a, a friend's garden. Uh, her name's Leslie Needham. She lives in Bedford. And she's just left Yarrow, Achillea, just grow up on her terrace. And it's, it's an incredible plant for, um, well, it used to be important for medicine, but now for bees and butterflies. But there it is, just <clears throat> seeding in her wonderful old stones. And I thought, yes, I love this. And this is Baptisia, um, one of our most glorious natives for the garden. And if any of you have it right now and it's blooming, you know that it's full of bees. Um, it's also, I think, a host um, to a lot of butterfly larvae. This is Veronicastrum. Um, it grows in our little wetland. It grows, uh, it loves, it, it particularly loves in nature to grow in wet meadows. Um, but actually this is a picture of it in my garden, in a pretty dry place. And um, it does find, when it's blooming, it's just alive with bees. And it's kind of a nice vertical in your garden in the, the middle of the summer. This is um, one of our fields at, at our place. We call it Church House. And of course, it's, it's Black Eyed Susan's, Ruth Becky, and And um, the Black Eyed Susan offers nectar to a whole bunch of butterflies, but particularly, in, in our case, to a, an endangered northern metal mark butterfly. And we happen to have in our woods um, the the, uh, the the flower. It's not a flower; it's a leaf. Um, something called it's, it's something called Pacra obovata, which is what the that northern metal mark butterfly larva eat. It's the only thing they eat. So I love the idea that they're eating in the woods. And then, and then when they turn into butterflies, they're getting nectar from the black-eyed Susans. Um, the other thing you see in this picture is a lobelia that's new to me and, until I came to the northwest corner, and it's called lobelia spicata. And of course, we all know this. This is lobelia syphilitica. And actually, this picture I took in our wet meadow. Um, it's, it's native here, but it's a wonderful garden plant. I used to have a lot of it in my garden at, at Duck Hill. Um, Robert Reimer and Tricia right here uh, took me, I think it was last year, on, to this place on Route 63. It's between Canaan and Cornwall. <clears throat> and it's just a, a, this extraordinary field of Physostegia. Um, it's a wet field. I think you can see in the distance, um, Joe Pye weed, all here. But it was, it was just acres and acres of Physostegia, which is called the obedient plant. And Jeb Brees just told me recently that there's a reason it's called the obedient plant, um, which is, it's rather stiff flower. But if you push the stem, It'll go like that, and it'll stay that way. <laughs> this is ironweed, Fernonia, um, another native that loves it wet, or at least damp. But here it is in a corner of my garden, doing just fine, with Rudbeckia triloba in front. And here it is in August, just dancing with black swallowtail butterflies. Um, we have a, a little wetland on our property. It's, it's called a fen because it's a calcareous wetland. And it is full of Jopiri. It's just magical. But um, this, I wanted some Jopiri in the garden. And I took this picture after it rained rather heavily, so it's kind of um, 
but amazingly, it doesn't always have to be in wet ground. It can be in our gardens, and it's such a statuesque, beautiful plant. And of course, um, butter, butterfly pollen for sure. We all know um, bergamot. It, this is uh, Monarda fistulosa, and it is it is just it paints our fields around here sort of a mauvey lavender in July. And it's, it's a great bee and butterfly plant. I just love it. Here it is at our place in July. And of course, Asclepius um, tuberosa, the butterfly weed, which, uh, which will be blooming also in July. It likes it just, this is true with bergamot too. It, it actually likes it hot and dry and poor and sandy. Um, so if you have a spot like that, plant some butterfly weed. And this is the, this is milkweed, the other Asclepius, which we all need to allow um, to, to grow in our fields because it's so crucial to the monarch butterfly. And this is a picture, not a very good picture, I must say, of a wonderful goldenrod um, called uh, Solidago speciosa. And despite the myth that goldenrods cause hay fever, they don't. Um, they don't. What's causing the hay fever at, at that time of when the goldenrods are blooming is ragweed. Ragweed throws its pollen out into the air, and we all sneeze and our eyes water. But goldenrod does not. Goldenrod holds on to its pollen, and um, and that pollen is for the bees. And uh, Doug Ptolemy says that goldenrods, this species goldenrod, is one of nature's great gifts to animal life. Um, particularly the pollen for native bees. But he also says that it ranks, it's one of the top ranking plants for hosting ecologically valuable caterpillars um, that feed breeding birds and fall migrants. And there are many, um, there, I think there's something like a hundred species of native uh, goldenrod. And many of them, and they bloom at different times, and many of them are incredibly beautiful and not as th thuggish as the Canada goldenrod, which we we'll, really will just take over. Um, this was a, a friend's garden in North Salem where we used to live, and it was all just goldenrod and asters. And I love that the, the garden proper was in the front, and then she had this bench looking out onto this magical, um, the asters just uh, were so beautiful. Uh, and this is a this is a pool that Edwina von Gaal um, designed out in the Hamptons, and she just surrounded it with goldenrod. There you go, just did it. <laughs> and this is a picture of Pete Uldoff's garden um, in in Holland a number of years ago when I was there. And he used to always play our native uh, meadow and, and prairie plants against green architecture. Um, he had these amazing hedges. And apparently, eventually those hedges got some disease and he cut them all out and he just now, uh, his garden is just all the, the prairie plants. But it, it was really extraordinary. I was there one September. It was rather extraordinary to see. And, and this is one of my favorite gardens anywhere ever. It's called Jardin Plume. It's in um, Normandy in France. And these, this couple who made this garden in, in a part of France that's very flat, full of hay fields, um, are having so much fun with this idea of unmowing. 
And you'll see, well, first of all, they've taken our, our native plants and filled these amazing hedge-like places. Um, again, I think they were inspired maybe by peat Oldop because they had these wonderful waves of hedges. But inside, it's asters and veronicastrums and, and so on. But then beyond that, they just unmowed grass in squares and made a pattern of checkerboard, the checkerboard pattern. And it's very contemporary and thrilling. Um, uh, this was one time we were there rather late in the season. But you see that the hedges kind of go with the house. And then there are these squares of just unmowed grass, really meadow, and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated with these wonderful mowed paths um, in between, and then apple trees kind of cutting it. And um, I just think it's fun and original and another good example of unmowing. Um, this is the top of City Hall in uh, Chicago. It was when Mayor Daley was there. And it was their idea of a prairie on top of the roof. And I thought, what a great contrast with all that glass and steel. And what, what he said was that it really reduced the heat in the summer so they didn't have to use as much air conditioning. And also it absorbed the rain runoff. So it was ecologically good in all kinds of ways. Well, this is a kind of a bleak picture of the High Line, but again, that wonderful tension of, of our meadow plants um, against this hard architecture. This is um, the garden of a man named Ala Idu. He was a wonderful uh, garden designer in, um, at, well, in Provence. But this is his own home in Apt. Um, and indeed, a field where he has taken stone and made a sculpture. And this is his house, his old farmhouse. And above his house was a field, and he said it was really difficult to mow because it was full of pieces of limestone just scattered everywhere. So one summer, he spent hours picking up all the limestone and making a circle. And he said, the circle echoed the gorse and the hills of Provence. And he made this path to it. And it became, and he was able to mow. And it became kind of a magic place, land art. This is a meadow in Santa Barbara. And at the, in the distance, you'll see this wonderful stick uh, creation by Patrick Doherty. And he's one of our great land artists, earth artists. This is uh, Frank Cabot's place uh, called Catrevon in Quebec. But there's an astonishing arch celebrating the field beyond. And this is in Lakeville. This is um, the garden of Parker Bowen and Sandy Mirabile. And they built, Sandy built this wonderful pergola. And I just thought this, I was there by myself, and I thought, how wonderful to sit there with a glass of wine and look at that meadow and, and see what's happening, see the birds, see the butterflies. So at Duck Hill, we made a very small meadow. Um, at the edge of it, I planted the prairie rose, Rosa Sutigera. And uh, it, was, it was in a, a small, well, what, what used to be a small turnout uh, area when we had horses. And when I married Bosco, the horses were gone, and Bosco wanted a pool. And I said, okay, we're going to have a meadow around this pool. And so I 
I wanted a native meadow, and I didn't know how to do that really. And so I asked Larry Weiner if he would come and help me. He he wasn't so famous then, and. Um, he did something that I was slightly horrified about at the time, and then I now I'm totally horrified about, which is he insisted that we use Roundup or something like Roundup to kill everything um, on this half acre piece of, of land, and and so we did, and um, and then he came and sprinkled a mixture of seed of grasses, and I was particularly interested in native grasses, and forbs, all sorts of forbs. Well, the native grasses never really happened. Um, the grasses from the hay field right beyond us just marched right in. Um, but we did, have, we did have some wonderful flowers in that, in that meadow, and um, it was kind of nice swimming and looking at butterflies and, and birds. It was, it was, it, it sure be having lawn. Well, it, this is where we live now. And one of the reasons we bought it was there was a field. And there were the Berkshire Hills. And there were some nice trees, but there was a field. There were a couple of fields, actually. And Every, every year, I mow less lawn and I add a little more so that now those trees have field around them. Um, besides getting rid of uh, invasives, which in our case are um, spotted knapweed <coughs> and um, a little bit of bittersweet and a little bit of mugwort, I don't do anything to this field. Um, it's got a lot of non-native grasses in it, but it also has wonderful stretches of little blue stem. Um, here, you see the little blue stem. And I think because this, this field, this is the field in front of the house, um, it's very dry, it's very poor soil, it's very sandy, and the little blue stem loves it and just spreads. Every year, I see the sprigs of it. It's just so exciting. And in the back of the house, all around this little cutting garden, we also have a field that I'm allowing to encroach the house more and more every year. Um, and we have paths through it, as you see. Um, and this is a path going up to a, a, um, a place where we like to sit and look at the view. Um, and indeed, the back field is, without any help from me, full of flowers. It changes. When this picture was taken, it was about three years ago, and it was full of black-eyed Susans. The black-eyed Susans are very short-lived perennial, and we don't have all those black-eyed Susans now. We have other things. It's just, you know, a meadow is an ever-changing um, picture. And fleabane. And here's Sadie looking out from our mudroom at a path in the field. And in July, that path will be full of um, bergamot. And, and we have, again, in the back field, we have little blue stem. And we also have this, which is um, Indian grass. It's much higher, very bold, and it, it's just there. And again, now that we're only mowing once a year, usually in early spring, the native grasses are just increasing and increasing. And we leave it, um, well, we leave it in winter because um, of seed heads for the birds and places for the good bugs to be, um, to be harbored. I, I'm gonna finish by reading a, um, something from the book, uh, a, a little something from the book. As much as I love the gardens at Church House, it is the meadow, it, it really is the meadows lapping around the house that animate my days. 
whether I'm walking on our property or working in the garden or indoors looking out a window, the movement, the life those fields offer from wind and from the bird and insect life they attract is my fond distraction. A few days ago, it is June, as I was talking to a friend by the cutting garden, I stopped mid-sentence, suddenly distracted by the sight of a small chipping sparrow landing on the tip of a slender blade of meadow grass. The grass bent over dramatically with its weight, but astonishingly didn't break, and the little bird lingered there swaying in search of a seed or a tiny bug, I imagined, or just enjoying a swing. Thank you very much. Jane was just asking if there are any questions. If not, thank you. Yes. Once a year. Once a year. And we, we like to wait for spring because then, well, not only is the meadow beautiful in the wintertime, um, the silhouettes of the meadow, but also because it's habitat and, and food for the birds. So, yeah. Um, we have one section of meadow where we, where we have apple trees, and under the apple trees we have daffodils, and that section we mow in November because we don't want to mow when the daffodils are blooming. So, yeah. Yes, Warren? Uh, how does mowing affect the tick situation for you and for the dogs? Um, first of all, we have paths in the fields that we mow once a week. Second of all, and I know it's debatable, um, but, but ticks are primarily in the leaf litter and at the edge of the woods where the woods meet the fields or the woods meet the lawn. Um, Sadie, our beloved Sadie, uh, is in the fields every day hunting voles and she almost never ever has a tick. She's not, we have an invisible fence so she can't go to the woods. and. Um, when we go in the woods, we come back with ticks. I don't, I almost never get a tick in the fields. But anyway, um, so, but if you have mowed paths, you're fine anyway. Um, yeah, yes, Lynn. We moved into a house 15 years ago, and we um, leveled the ground and scraped it and put in grasses. And we lived next to a little wood, and the grasses came up, but so did um, the invasives, and it just poured in there. And I spent maybe three summers weaving invasives. We have multiflora rosa, we have river sweet, we have uh, euphorbia, like everywhere. So this is the reason, maybe not to start to to take everything out and start with the, with the bare soil because you're creating another garden that you're going to have to weed madly until those meadow plants are established. And um, that's why if you already have a field that maybe has, isn't perfectly native, it's, it's, a, it's a much easier way. It's a much easier way to work with it. I have a friend I have several friends who know so much about meadows who say um, clear, clear space, a circle in your high grass, in your field, whatever you've left unmowed, um, and plant plugs or, or seed or whatever there and watch them, let them get established, um, you know, be careful about them. Don't don't let weeds in that small circle. And then once they grow up and they're robust, they will be able to. They will start to spread out. And and that's one way of doing it. I I have to say I've um, planted plugs in our back field 
and then I forget to water them and they die. Or the rabbits eat them or something. So it's, it's, um, it's not always uh, easy. But I, I do think that if you, if you clear a space completely, um, you end up having to do a lot of weeding of, of invasives. Because, yeah, yes. Start with a, a field that's full of very mature invasives. They it's full of what? Very mature invasives, like bittersweet, you know, like cute, like thick, deep roots. Mm -hmm. Do you, I, I mean, they say you have to take the roots out, but is yeah. there some point where you don't have to go feet and feet down? And what, are there what, certain what, things what? that you what most horticulturalists would say, except Edwina wouldn't, um, is you when you have that kind of bittersweet, is you cut in August and September, you cut the stem right down to the ground, and you brush what's left of that stem with something like Roundup. And in August and September, the energy of the plant is going down into the roots, and so it's a good time to kill the plant. Um, Edwina would say, you just keep cutting it down, because she's totally organic, she wouldn't dream of using Roundup. But with bittersweet's tough. I'll be fighting bittersweet for the rest of my life. Uh, it's just, it's a tough one. Um, we just keep cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. Um, but, yeah. Yes. Hi, Peter. Yeah. All of the plants that you show have really beautiful flowers, but one of the things that is in my head is poison ivy. And uh, dewberry, uh, that little that kind of like dewberry. Around. And, it's, and they're, of course, native species as well. So they are. They're spread by birds and. Uh, I, that's a problem. I, I, you know, I, I've been, I, when I see, well, when I see poison ivy climbing trees, I thought I'd be such a good girl to cut it down to the ground. I mean, we have so much poison ivy in the woods, I wouldn't even begin to try and fight it. But I went on a, a walk with the wonderful head of Audubon recently, and it was in the fall, and we were looking up at this tree, and the birds were just feasting on poison ivy berries. And she said, oh, no, poison ivy is wonderful. And uh, I thought, oh. But having it in your field, I, you know, just don't walk there. Don't put your path there. I don't know what to say, Peter. Um, it's, 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 I mean, it's just an ongoing process. Yeah, it is an ongoing process. But, but what's important is to not be mowing all the time and to be nurturing um, some native plants so that, so that we don't have a loss of habitat and a loss of birds. I mean, that's, that's the whole idea, right? So, good luck with your meadows. <laughs>